like to start by pointing out the banner above his head, it's the preamble of the Bill of Rights. And it's, I focus on the preamble of the Bill of Rights time and time again because it's not taught in our schools. You won't find it in most of the constitutional textbooks, but it's part of the Constitution. And what it does, it tells us the purpose of the Bill of Rights. We don't have a Second Amendment right to own a weapon. The Constitution, the Bill of Rights, tells us the Second Amendment prevents the federal government from passing any law that has to do with a weapon. The problem is we have allowed the federal government to overreach and pass laws, and we haven't challenged them. So without further ado, I'd like for the panel to introduce themselves, and uh, then we'll start with Christina asking Congressman Johnny a question. I'm Paul T. Jansen. I'm with Let's Talk Smart Words. I'm Bill Conley. I'm a teacher at Gaffney High School, U.S. History. Uh, I'm Christina Jeffrey, homemaker and uh, part-time teacher at Walter and I teach the government. Thanks. Christina, would you like to start? Sure. <laughs> <laughs> No, I'm, I'm ready. Um, my question has to do with the HHS mandate and the, uh, the infringement on the religious liberties of all Americans. The, the uh, First Amendment to the Constitution passed almost immediately after the, the uh, first Congress assembled guarantees our religious freedoms. And the HHS mandate violates an important tenet of the Catholic Church that goes back 2,000 years. It was one of the things that differentiated uh, Christians from pagans, our respect for life, for unborn life. What can be done about this? Uh, well, we missed an opportunity in November. Uh, but aside from that, uh, I, I had uh, privilege may not be the right word, let's say opportunity uh, to have uh, Secretary uh, Sebelius come before one of our committees. And I asked uh, Secretary Sebelius because in her, uh, the promulgation of that rule, uh, which is part of the Affordable Care Act, uh, the promulgation of that rule said that she balanced uh, medical needs with with uh, religious liberty, which struck me as an interesting way of phrasing that because I wasn't aware that it was her prerogative to balance my right to religious liberty with anything. So I asked her about it, and if you haven't seen the YouTube, I would encourage you to go uh, watch to just how utterly unfamiliar she was with the Constitution. Uh, it was... Uh, it, it, it would be sad if it weren't so pathetic and if she weren't going to stick around for the second, uh, second term. Professor Jeffrey's question, I, I want to just give you a little bit of, of background. Uh, there have been a number of Supreme Court cases where religious groups have challenged uh, rules, regulations, laws promulgated either by the federal government or by state governments. Uh, for instance, I think all of us would acknowledge that having an educated citizenry is a good thing. We want people who are educated. So when a state passes a law that you must stay in school until a certain age, in this case it was until the age of 14, a religious group objected because they didn't want their kids staying in school until age 14. They wanted them going until they were 12, and then they wanted them going to work on the farm. So their religious group objected. They sued in federal court, and guess who won? How about animal sacrifice? I've got three dogs, judge, jury, and bailiff. That's their names. That's their names. I don't, I'm not a big fan of animal sacrifice. But there was a religious group in Florida. When Florida passed a statute outlawing animal sacrifice, a religious group protested and said it's part of our religious ceremony. So they challenged it. Guess who won? How about license tags? When the state wants to put a certain phrase on a license tag and the Jehovah's Witnesses objected to it, they sued. Guess who won? 
How about a Christian school that wanted to decide whether or not to hire or rather retain a teacher? They wanted to get rid of a teacher because the teacher did not was not a member of their faith. So they got rid of her and she sued, and the name of the case is Hosanna Tabor, and it went to the United States Supreme Court, and the decision was nine to nothing that the government cannot tell religious schools which teachers to keep and not keep. So how in the world can they tell Notre Dame University or a company that happens to have been started and founded by a practicing Catholic that you have to offer contraception and abortifacients. How can you do that? We had a panel of bishops and others. If you're not familiar with the Beckett Fund, you ought to get familiar with it. They've done really good work on religious liberty. And you know what I think is going to happen, uh, Professor Jeffrey, is this is tangled up in the courts now. Hobby Lobby sued, other people have sued. My guess is that that tenet of faith to, to Catholics is so important that they will engage in civil disobedience before they will before they will follow it. And you know what? Those of us who are not Catholic ought to be right there beside them. Yeah. Because tomorrow it will be something else that, that impacts Jewish believers or, or, or people of Jewish faith. It will be Baptist or Presbyterians. This is the time. Look, they promulgated this rule to perpetuate the myth that we had a war against women. They're losing the battle when it comes to abortion because of something called an ultrasound. They're losing the battle. So now they want to switch and have a conversation about contraception so they can that they can perpetuate this myth that we have a war on women. And in the process, they've happened to have stumbled upon your First Amendment right to religious liberty. We had a chance in November to stop it. We're going to have a chance in the courts to stop it. If we don't stop it in the courts, this country has a long tradition of civil disobedience, which I hope we will exercise yes. before anyone allows the federal government to tell our Catholic brothers and sisters that you must violate your faith. So that's what Next question, Bill, when you place a question, can you use the microphone? Okay. Loud enough, I'm sure they're doing yeah. hear me in the back. I got some way back up. there. Stand up. I'll stand up. All right. In a follow-up to that question, the Tenth Amendment provides powers not delegated to the United States by the Constitution, nor prohibited by it to the states or reserved to the states, respectively, or to the people. Following up on your question of nullification, <coughs> at what point? Thomas Jefferson, James Madison, authoring the Kentucky Virginia resolutions, and we've seen nullification. How far do you think we should take? How far, far do you think we will take this idea of nullification to uh, to, uh, to go forth on these on these ideas we're talking about here? And one of them being the health care act. Well, nullification uh, has been debated in this country for a couple hundred years up to and including this afternoon when I uh, met with uh, four of my friends in Greenville and then had a conversation with my colleague Mick Mulvaney on that, this very point. I never remember studying it in law school, but there are lots of things I didn't study in law school that I probably should have. Here's the way I look at it. If, if, if we, if I say we, if Congress promulgated uh, passed a law that said you must do X and X violated your deeply held religious conviction uh, you wouldn't do it so you would in essence nullify that the question is do you go from zero to 100 miles an hour or are there incremental stages along the way and I think um and of course, it depends upon what 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 the the agreement is. If if it's um, well, take the Affordable Care Act, take Obamacare. 
we challenged the NFIB versus Sebelius in South Carolina joined that case. And Alan Wilson did a wonderful job. And lest anybody in the audience forget, we won on two of the three counts. We, we won on the Commerce Clause, which is really important. We won on Medicaid, which is really important. We just lost on the tax and spend. So one of the ways to challenge a law that you don't agree with is to challenge the constitutionality of it. That's one of the incremental <coughs> stages. I think it may have been Federal Paper 44, but uh, I stand to be corrected. They cited one of the remedies for uh, an overreaching federal government, replace the representatives that did what you found to be wrong, uh, which is another form of nullification, not with a capital N. You have the doctrine of interposition. Uh, you also have civil disobedience. So it strikes me that, you know, if it's real ID, that was an example of nullification being successful. The last Supreme Court case that dealt with nullification, uh, and unless y'all are aware of one after it that I'm not aware of, um, emanated from, from, from Arkansas, uh, Aaron versus Cooper. And this dealt with the integration of schools. And Arkansas um, said that they were not going to inter integrate the schools, despite the fact that the, the federal government said you are. And so they went to the Supreme Court, and it was a unanimous decision. And the Supreme Court, using the Supremacy Clause, said, um, yes, you are. And Arkansas did. That's the last case on nullification that I'm aware of. There have been examples where it was successful with real ID. There are examples where it was not successful, Aaron versus Cooper. I would, you know, if any of my friends in the state legislature ask, I, I would probably encourage them to take an incremental approach for this reason. I, I don't fully know what the practical ramifications of it will wind up being. I think there was a letter to the editor written by another Professor Jeffrey that said, unless you have an army, I don't know where you're going with it. Um, by the same token, we have witnessed, you know, the fact that you're asking me a question about nullification necessarily means something has already gone wrong. Either the state government has uh, found its way into something that was enumerated for the federal government to do, or the federal government has overstepped its limitations. I mean, it's the only way you get to this conversation. So it, it has some appeal to me that you correct it at the lowest level that you can correct it. And, and the ballot box would probably be the lowest level you can correct it. Uh, we haven't been terribly successful there. And the other thing to keep in mind is um, to harken back to equity, the equitable doctrine of unclean hands. Have we accepted any money from the federal government as a state um, that was outside the federal government's authority to spend. Do we have unclean hands? Um, did we stop it the very first time that there was a, there was an expansion beyond the, the enumerated powers, or did we just wink and nod until finally we said we we've had enough? I wish Alan were here because when you challenge without getting into too much detail. When you challenge the constitutionality of a federal statute, which South Carolina did, then you're necessarily consenting, or one could argue, you're necessarily consenting that the federal court is going to be the arbiter of whether or not there was an overstep, or else you wouldn't have sued, right? So you went on two and you lose on one. To then go from that, which necessarily assumes that the federal court is the proper arbiter of what's constitutional and what's not, to then go from that in court, in the Supreme Court, I was there for the oral argument, to we don't like the result, so we're going to go to nullification. Um, that's an interesting progress to take. Because at one hand, a year ago, you're consenting that the federal court is the proper decision maker. 
and now you're saying there's not. I, I will disagree with Marbury versus Madison from this standpoint. Marbury versus Madison, as you know, is where the Supreme Court said we are the final arbiter of what is constitutional and what is not. The Constitution begs to differ. The Constitution has given Congress in two different places the ability to limit the jurisdiction of the Supreme Court. And the last thing I'll say about nullification, unless it's brought back up again, I think, to my knowledge, everybody just put their hand on the heart and pledged allegiance to the flag. And at least in my version, I use the word indivisible. What does the word mean? Just, just a quick follow-up, but we see this, and it's pushed by the federal government immigration laws that they will not enforce. Therefore, is that not nullification? gun laws, et cetera, that they will not enforce. Is that not also nullification by the federal government? If the Justice Department will not pursue that, is that not outright nullification? And instead of going to the Supreme Court and say, well, the Supreme Court says this, they just say, again, I guess that's civil disobedience by our federal government. Uh, you know, it's, it, it's, it's worse than that. It is electioneering. It is using something as sacrosanct, as respect for the rule of law, to appeal to one constituency or another so you can win an election. Yeah. And, and I watched Janet Napolitano sit in front of us and explain why she was not going to enforce a law that was passed by Congress and signed by the President. And then I listened as Eric Holder said, we're not going to defend the Defense of Marriage Act even though Congress passed it and Bill Clinton signed it. We're not going to defend it. So, look, I would... I, I'll be happy to have a competition with you as to who's more frustrated. <laughs> I'll be happy to have that conversation. I, I just, when it comes to remedies and, and ways to manifest your frustration, I, I think as a state we would be better served taking an incremental response. And, and, it, and if that incremental response proves to be unsatisfactory, then we can have the final conversation. Make two points real quick. You talked about one of the incremental steps being interposition. Interposition by the states, don't you mean? Yes. Isn't that nullification? That's where the states, as they did in the Real ID Act, were able to say, no, we're not going to enforce this law. So nullification does and has worked. Uh, we're not talking about bloody civil war. We're just talking about using the power of the state legislature to get up and say, it's up to the state legislature to do that. They've got to interpose on our behalf. No more than a call. My, my, my response to that would be this. Aaron versus me. Arkansas said, we're not going to integrate our schools. The Supreme Court said, yes, you are. I don't think real ID is the kind of an issue where federal troops are going to come to your state and make you do it. Integration may well be. So at what point, at what point, when I talk about the practical implications of nullification, uh, I go back to what Professor Jeffrey, the other Professor Jeffrey said. They don't have an army. Where does it stop? I'm going to let it go there because I can go forever. Right. <laughs> Trey, your answer, answer greatly interested me. I had a. Can you stand down, please? Yeah. Trey, your answer was greatly interesting to me. I had a handwritten request from a friend of mine, a question from a friend of mine on the other side of the aisle, along the same lines. And he asked, as a member of the U.S. Congress and as an attorney trained in law, could you explain to some of our state legislators why their efforts to, quote, nullify any federal law? is a waste of time and taxpayer money on the Article 6 and Amendment 14 of the U.S. Constitution. And then my additional, I guess, comment question to that is if the Chief Justice cloaks it in a tax, what sort of action, and I think you've illustrated a little bit of action we can take against it on the federal level, could half of the Congress say, no, this is not a tax, and go from there with that, uh, with that assist in making another Supreme Court change? Uh, Paul, that's a good question, and, and I'm going to start with a practical response. Uh, 
you know, I think a lot of us were very excited when John Roberts was named to be the Chief Justice. And yet a lot of us were very disappointed when he had the deciding vote in what to us is a really important case. And it illustrates the point that elections have consequences. And oftentimes, and I'll speak as a Republican, even though I know the author of the question is on the other side of the aisle. Oftentimes, as Republicans, we don't get it right when it's our turn to pick Supreme Court justices. <laughs> and if you want me to prove that, then I'll just cite for you Brennan and Warren and Souter and That's <laughs> uh, Blackman. Who, who, who picked Blackman? We did. Can you name for me a Supreme Court justice appointed by a Democrat who surprised you with his or her conservatism? Because I just named four that surprised all of us with their lack of conservatism. So, the question was, what can we do? The Supreme Court said it's, it's a tax. Uh, Congress um, can undo uh, the Affordable Care Act tomorrow if we had the votes to do it. I think what's going to undo the Affordable Care Act, in all reality, is the fact that Justice Roberts let it go forward. Uh, it will collapse on itself. People are finding things in that act that are stunning them. The question is how much carnage is reaped between now and that time. What are other challenges? There are lots of parts of the Affordable Care Act that have not been challenged. And it can be tied up in court. The other you know, thing implicit in that questioner's question was something about waste of time. Um, I, I'm going to let the state legislature, uh, trust me, nobody in Congress should be lecturing state legislators about <laughs> waste of time. We have named post offices in states I never knew existed. <laughs> Even if the president's right, they're 57 states. I still have of all of them. I, I will say this. Uh, the states are frustrated. And, and they ought to be frustrated. And I'm frustrated. And, and Mulvaney and Duncan and, and Timmy are frustrated too. And their frustration manifests itself in, in different ways. And uh, whether it's the Second Amendment, whether it's recess appointments, whether it's the HHS mandate, there is a sense that the Ninth and Tenth Amendments mean nothing anymore. They mean nothing. And, and that frustration um, is warranted. And I don't think it's a waste of time for this reason. I think every opportunity you can take to remind the federal government that it is a limited powers government and it is limited to the enumerated powers, every opportunity you can to remind us of that is a, is a point well taken with, with respect to whoever asked the question on the other side. I have another, another follow-up to that question, and it's uh, more specific. When uh, some peyote-smoking drug counselors uh, took their firing to court, I think it was the Smith something case, Congress passed the Religious, Religious Freedom Restoration Act. Couldn't we have the new religious freedom or the more restoration freedom act from this congress yeah the uh the act that she's making reference to i think the sense of letter is actually still on judiciary with me which more function that he's been there too long than anything else if he's, if he's been there for all of that uh from the time of the indians until now uh, he's been there <laughs> He was former chairman, and, and what Professor Jeffrey is making reference to is there is a statute that sets out how you analyze uh, religious liberty cases. Um, because, I mean, let, let's be candid with each other. There's not a right you have that doesn't have some limit to it. You, you have a First Amendment right, but that doesn't mean you have a First Amendment right to spread malice about non-public officials. Public officials, you can say what you want. But non-public <laughs> officials, you can't. You don't have a right. You don't have a right 
to um, uh, uh, produce pornography. Uh, you don't have a right to, to yell fire at a crowded theater. So there are right, there are limitations on your rights, and and what and what the religious Freedom Restoration Act did is it codified what that analysis is. And, and this is what it is. Congress can restrict even a right as fundamental as religious liberty if they have a compelling reason to do so. Compelling reason to do so. And there are no less intrusive alternatives. You with me? And now, compelling is an incredibly high standard. In fact, I can't think of a case where the ID free, whatever that word means, contraception to everyone who wants it. Is the only way we can do it by making people of the Catholic faith violate their religious beliefs. Is that the only way we can do it? Nope. No. No! I'll tell you a way we can do it. Some of my friends, Sheila Jackson Lee, Maxine Waters, John uh, Dingle, John Conyers, anyone who is all of a sudden now terribly concerned about lack of access to contraception could have introduced a bill in Congress providing free contraception to anyone who wants it. There, I did it. That is less restrictive than the route they chose. So it would never pass the federal statute. The question is, does the federal statute apply to federal laws or federal and state laws? And that is an undecided question. The Supreme Court has never ruled on that. I'd like to follow up on that real quick. Can I touch on something that's dear to my heart? Can I ask a question? I thought the original purpose of the Bill of Rights was to restrict the Congress and not the states. I know about incorporation, but isn't that kind of crazy? You're going to have to take that up with uh, the uh, 13, 14, 15 Amendment folks, the Doctrine of Incorporation. Uh, which of the amendments in the Bill of Rights apply to the states and which ones do not? Uh, if memory serves, the second and the seventh have never been applied to the states. One through eight inclusive, uh, excluding those two have been. So I'm not the author of the doctor. Look, I, you can blame me for a lot of things, but the doctrine of incorporation, I, I, I wasn't around for that. Despite the presence of gray hair, I did not do the doctrine of incorporation. Christina touched exactly on my, the point I wanted to make, is if the, the way the country was set up was the states would decide you couldn't yell fire in a crowded building, not the federal government. Federal government doesn't have that authority under the First Amendment, regardless of the 14th. We can argue the 14th all day as far as, and I understand the incorporation, but it's, it's being, in my opinion, it's wrong to say that the 14th all of a sudden incorporated restrictions on the federal government to the states. They're going to rest restrict the states as well? That, that doesn't make a lot of sense. Uh, or instead of. Artie, that's a great argument. I'm sure it was made in the Supreme Court. When they right before they rejected it, I mean, I, I can't, I cannot undo the incorporation doctrine. Uh, among my many limitations, that all but the second and the seventh have been applied to the states, which means, which means, just like the federal government cannot restrict, for instance, your your Fifth Amendment right to uh, to not incriminate yourself. What Artie is saying, and he's right, initially the Bill of Rights were drafted to apply as restrictions on the federal government. The Supreme Court, through something called incorporation, also said states cannot uh, force you to testify against yourself. We can litigate that until Jesus comes back, but, uh, but, but I don't think it's going to change. I'm just wondering if anybody brought that argument up. No, I'm kidding. Uh, look, we had a really good... And by the way, I don't know if anybody's going to ask about recess appointments or not. Good, good I'll save it. i got a really neat story for y'all. Well, thanks for the lead-in. NLRB. Stand up, stand up. Okay. The NLRB, just what he was talking about, recess appointments. Who gets to decide when Congress is in recess? 
what can they do while they are on quote recess? Is it a true recess? How far overreaching? And I think we've already seen that the Supreme Court finally slapped somebody's hands hard and said, "No, you can't." Now again, it was what a three-member panel. Does it now go to these? Is it going to go even higher than that? And what is your belief is going to happen? And how far now can we, if we have that, can we start, I guess, appealing to them or hopefully that they'll start making more decisions that do that? Because again, we had the gun law when they're talking about the, the gun case. You try and use the Commerce Clause and saying you can't have a gun near a school. And those kind of cases are now starting to turn around to more conservative view. Well, uh, among the many frustrations of having control of one half of one third of government, one of the few bright spots is when you have control of the House, you have control of the House Oversight Committee. And you can subpoena witnesses to explain executive branch overreach. In fact, we had an entire judiciary hearing entitled Executive Branch Overreach, and the hardest issue was which one to pick because you only get five minutes. <laughs> I picked actually HHS. But let's talk about recess appointments. Um, if you look at the Constitution, it does provide that the chief executive can make recess appointments provided the vacancy occurs during the period. All right, that's been, you know, you go back and think in, in, in the times when the framers framed this, they did not envision a year-round Congress. Uh, they didn't envision transportation being what it is. So there were recesses that were longer. And the theory went that if we lose a Secretary of Defense, somebody who's indispensable, um, that the President ought to have the ability to appoint someone if Congress is on recess, rather than reconvening everybody to come back. Con the President can do it for the remainder of that legislative term. All right? In the interest of bipartisanship, both sides have abused recess appointments. The Constitution also provides that with certain appointments, the Senate gets to provide its advice and consent. Well, they get to provide their advice. They have to provide their consent. So something called the NLRB, the National Labor Relations Board, you probably last heard of them when they were trying to sue to keep Boeing from coming to South Carolina. Yes. Yep. But they're still around, and they had some vacancies. And the president made recess appointments. Also, the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau, which was going to be headed by a lady by the name of Elizabeth Warren. Uh, the Lord smiled on us, and she ran for the Senate in Massachusetts. But Richard Cordray, former Attorney General in Ohio, was picked to head the CFPB. So the president made recess appointments. All right? Now you think back, okay, well, maybe the Senate was out of recess for several months, and maybe the president can make an argument that even though we've never had a CFPB before, it's so important to the fabric of our republic that we can't wait until the Senate reconvenes. Maybe you could make that argument. The problem with making that argument is the Senate never adjourned. They picked up this tactic when there was a president by the name of Bush. They didn't want him making any recess appointments. So the way they kept him from making recess appointments was they would gavel in the Senate each day. It's called a pro forma session. Nobody was around. But the Senate decides when they adjourn. The president doesn't decide when they adjourn. The Senate does. And they decided they weren't adjourning. So the President Bush got to make no recess appointments because Harry Reid pulled that trick. Well, some of us were paying attention. So the House and the Senate decided we're not going to consent to adjournment. We're going to have pro forma sessions which will defeat the recess appointments. And the president did it anyway. I, I want, I don't mean to send all y'all to YouTube, but we, but we had a hearing on it. We had a hearing on it. We had several hearings on it. And a constitutional law professor from a law school that escapes me right now essentially agreed 
that if the Senate takes a lunch break or a nap, which has been known to happen the time. <laughs> Tim Scott lowered the average age by 20 years when he, when he got there. But a lunch break, if the president says you're not available to give advice and consent on my nominee and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to make a recess appointment, why not? Why not? He did it when they were on, in, in what he called recess for three days. If three days is enough, how about three hours? So we went to court. The House does not have standing to challenge that. The Senate did not have standing. Well, the Senate had standing, but Harry Reid runs the Senate. So you had to get a group that was impacted by an NLRB ruling. And they decided to hire a lawyer. And some of y'all may remember his name. Miguel Estrada. <laughs> you ever heard of him? Yeah. Yes. Oh, yeah. yes, he should have been on the D.C. Court of Appeals and by now would be on the United States Supreme Court, but they filibustered him and kept him from coming up for a vote even though there were 55 votes to confirm him. They never let his name come up. He's a brilliant appellate attorney and they hired him and it was a three to nothing decision and the D.C. Court of Appeals, including one of the judges, was Karen LaCraft Henderson from right here in South Carolina. And what's the first thing they do after the judge goes the way they don't want them to? They nullify. They post the names of the presidents that appointed them. They said they were all three Republican judges. Have you ever seen them do that when something goes their way? No. Three to nothing. They say they're going to appeal it, but I'll bet you they do not. Because they'll lose in the Supreme Court. Wasn't always also in that that, and you said it. You made the statement that the opening has to come during that recess. Also, that's what the Constitution says. That's not <laughs> what the Supreme Court has said. Um, that is an unsettled question. But 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 let's I mean, look at the chronology of what happened. The president made one of his NLRB <coughs> appointments on December the 17th. You with me? December the 17th. The vacancy had existed for more than four months. Okay, More than four months, but yet this position is so indispensable to the fabric of our republic that he needs to make a recess appointment. But he left it vacant for four months. You know when he made his recess appointment? January the 3rd. So from December the 17th to January the 3rd was too long for him to win. The Senate, who could the calendar of the Senate? Who's in power? How many hearings did he set on their confirmation? How many, how many hearings did he set for the NLRB and Richard Cordray? None. So he gets to set no hearings, no confirmation process, and the president can wait about two weeks after he sends a name and says, oh, y'all haven't done your job yet, I'm going to make a recess appointment. And thank the Lord the D.C. Court of Appeals said you're wrong, and it was three to nothing. Trey, this, one, this one's about president, presidential executive power. And this has been a question that, and a trend line that's interested me for a number of years. The question came from the floor. said, does Congress plan to do anything about the executive orders issued in the last few years? Will there be any bills introduced to legislate, nullify, repeal any of these quote-unquote laws made by the President in his first four years? Can you maybe give me an overview of how the executive order system evolved if that's an abuse of power by the President? I'll try to, Paul. You know, again, both both parties have made use of executive orders. And the way executive orders are supposed to be used, I want you to imagine an executive we have here in Spartan County. Chuck Wright is a member of the executive branch. He's a sheriff. I want you, I want you to imagine that Sheriff Wright is going to send a memo to his department that because of limited resources, we are going to focus most of our energies on pursuing cocaine cases above a certain drug amount. 
because of limited resources, I'm the chief executive, I'm directing you, as members of the executive branch who work for me, spend your resources on this. How many of you think he cannot send that memo to his staff? He can. Now, how many of you think he can send a memo that says, our Congress won't get off its behind and make a certain drug illegal? And I'm tired of seeing it and I'm tired of dealing with it. So I want you to go arrest everyone who has this certain drug, even though the General Assembly and Congress have never acted. How many of you think he can do that? He can't. So he can instruct within the realm of his, you know, look at the president's executive orders um, after Newtown. If you've read them, some of them you scratch your head and say, why are you not already doing that? Why, why did you wait until Newtown to tell your federal law enforcement agencies to cooperate with one another? <laughs> that is not outside the realm of the power of a chief executive. When you start changing the law, when you start reinterpreting the law, and I'll give you an example of that. Jenna Napolitano issued a memo under the theory of an executive order, Paul, that since we're closing in on an election last summer, we're not going to remove or have removal hearings for the following categories of illegal immigrants. No hearings. She called that prosecutorial discretion. Other people call it amnesty. Some people call it electioneering. There are limits. But, but, I, but Paul, I think we would have more credibility if we would challenge our own party. If, if we would say to a Republican president, if any of us live long enough to see it on, if we would say to a member of our own party, you have exceeded your authority. I think that would carry even more away. I, I've analyzed his executive orders. There are two of them that I would want us to have more hearings on. Uh, the others, I think, fall within the purview of telling executive branch entities, whether it be the Bureau or ATF or DEA, to do certain things which the chief executive, and that's what the president is, can do, just like your sheriff, can tell his people. He can't change the law, but he can certainly encourage them within, within the parameters of, of his job. Uh, there are executive orders have been around for what? That was the first one. It seems like there's more in recent years. We actually counted them. Because uh, I get an email that there are more. I think there were more starting, not with the current president, but, but, but maybe with one before him or two before him. Uh, but I, I, I had at one point, if anybody wants it, I'll get you the number of which president or which presidents have issued the most number of executive orders. Um, and I'll be interested as to how many of those were administrative and how many are strategic or overreaching into the power of the Congress. Which will require a, a, an order by order analysis. And Do you have a ballpark figure? It's like a document. <laughs> I would I'm putting you on the spot. I'd be guessing, and it wouldn't be fair to you for me to guess, but I'll get you an educated answer. I'll get you one. <coughs> Christina, you got a quick one? I, I do. We got five uh, minutes left. Can, can I do one thing before? I just saw a man I used to work with, uh, a law enforcement officer. Will y'all help? Is that Marshall? That's not Marshall Roby show in the back, is it? Never mind. I was going to get you to put your hands together for Marshall Roby show. Why don't you do it for Stephen Brown instead? <laughs>
And unfortunately, it seems like most of them have ambition for themselves and their re-election. All right, this is a question of the power of the federal courts we've been talking about a lot. Article 3, Section 1 of the Constitution establishes the judicial power of the United States and one supreme court and such inferior courts as the Congress may from time to time ordain and establish. Do you believe that Congress has the constitutional authority and responsibility to prevent what Thomas Jefferson referred to as judicial tyranny by following the advice of James Madison when he advised that we need a remedy for when even the judicial branch betrays us? I think you mentioned um, uh, Article 3, Section 2, uh, ability of Congress to limit the, the uh, jurisdiction, the, jurisdiction of, of, uh, the appellate jurisdiction of the courts. Is that the remedy you would advocate, or are there other remedies that you would advocate for judicial overreach? Well, the big one is impeachment. In fact, I served, yes. I served with a federal judge who was impeached, but that did not prevent him from being elected to Congress. <laughs> that's, that, that's a fact. The judiciary has standards. Um, you can impeach federal judges. Uh, you can limit the jurisdiction. Their pay is linked to Congress's, which means they're not going to get a pay raise for a long time. Um, <coughs> And they're not happy about having their pay like the Congress either. Uh, you know, I, I, I was in the federal system for six years. Um, I think we're pretty fortunate in South Carolina. But the best way to correct judicial mistakes is before they happen. And uh, and to vet people. I used to have a conversation with Senator DeMint uh, before he left to go to Heritage. Uh, Senator Gray is an attorney. Uh, Timmy Scott is not. Um, the federal judges that our senators pick will far outlive and outlast the senators and in some ways will have more of an impact on on us than, than even a member of the United States Senate. So the best way to do it is to prevent the mistakes up front. There have been I guess in the last 10 years, maybe six impeachments of federal judges. But the reality is you have to literally uh, commit a felony to be impeached. Uh, and even then, it may not be a foregone conclusion. Impeaching judges for bad decisions, um, it hadn't been done. You mentioned uh, Jefferson, I guess it was. I can't help but keep in mind that Hamilton worried that the Judiciary would not be powerful enough. Uh, if Aaron Burr hadn't killed him and he were still around, I wonder what he would say now. Change his mind. Yeah, they, they are not lacking in, in power and influence. <clears throat> the Congress will have to go leave in just a few minutes. I wanted to ask you something. You talked about opening the door. Well, I want to know what you think. Since President Obama's been opening the door with executive orders that actually make law, the next president we have that is pro-life, he's opened the door to him, the president issuing an executive order restricting abortion. Do you have a comment on that? Well, I think some of that's happened, especially with respect to foreign aid, hasn't it? What was it, the Mexico, Mexico policy? <coughs> um, you know, already. That would, that, that's always the temptation, is when people do something we don't like, when we get back in power, we do it back to them. I would rather us uh, get back to the way it should have been and start by, <clears throat> Christina mentioned policing the executive branch. Uh, we tried with something called the RAINS Act, uh, which is regulatory relief, and it passed the House overwhelmingly. I'm not complaining because I signed up to run, but I, I'm telling you, it, it's really frustrating when you have a Senate controlled by Harry Reid. I mean, they're, they're, they're just nothing good. The Range Act is a wonderful piece of legislation that will never see the light of day because it won't be voted on in the Senate. Could that happen? Yes. I, I would prefer. There's nothing more refreshing to me, Artie, than having someone acknowledge the restraints on their own power. When I, when I was the DA, 
solicitors have the right to call whatever the case they want, whenever they want to call it. That's a huge power for me to be able to call a case on you because maybe I don't like your defense attorney, even though you were arrested a year ago, and I'm not going to call your case even though you were arrested three years ago because you're, you know, I like you, or, or maybe the media is more interested in yours. That's a huge power. And I got with Barry Barnett. By the way, y'all got the best solicitor in the state of South Carolina. Barry, Barry is fantastic. But I got with Barry, and I said, you know what? We shouldn't have this power. We're going to give it to the judge. We gave it to Judge Roger Couch. You run the docket. History is not replete with instances of people ceding back power. Usually you got to take it from them. But it would be really refreshing to have a president, hopefully a Republican president, that acknowledges there are limits, constitutional limits, on what he can do. You would think being the leader of the free world would be enough, that you wouldn't have to take other people's power, but apparently it's not. So I would argue against President, pro-life president doing that. Good. That would be the wrong. Good. I agree. Good. But anyway, Bill, did you have one question? What is the final remedy, if there is one, to things like a Congress that can't pass a budget, which is constitutionally provided for, when they break the Constitution? Statutorily. Statutorily, okay. When they break these things and they do these things, what is our remedy other than, again, we go back to the where we started, I guess, with nullification, and when we get down to it, and we talk about the sheriff's initiative, that when they come knocking on the door, we have a sheriff's department that stands in between us and them. You know, we, we passed no budget, no pay. Um, Chuck Schumer shocked all of us and said that they're going to pass a budget. Um, <laughs> it, 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 did, he it, did he give you a time paper? Uh, would you believe it if he had? No. Um, <laughs> Uh, he's too busy working on gun control. <laughs> Here's the frustrating part. Paul has, both times I've been there, Paul has passed a budget. And budgets are nothing more than your priorities. This is how you're going to spend a limited amount of money. When you don't have to pass a budget, then you can run on a slogan, like a balanced approach, or fairness for all. That's beautiful. It's irresistible. It's just not a budget. So the fact that the Senate is going to pass a budget this year, or they say they are, because we pass no budget, no pay. You don't pass a budget, which, by the way, who knows, trivia question, which amendment is implicated by no budget, no pay? Anybody have a copy of the Constitution? You can't change it within this the last one. The last one. The 27th Amendment says compensation for members of Congress cannot be varied. So, did we break the Constitution by passing no budget, no pay? Yes. Here's why I tell you we did Because uh, the money's being escrowed. And if we wanted, hear me out. Hear me out. If we wanted to change the way we're paid from once a month to twice a month, does that violate the Constitution? No. If we wanted to change it from once a month to once a quarter, does that violate the Constitution? No. Then how is escrowing it violating the Constitution? No. You're going to get your money. It just might be the last day of session if you don't pass a budget. Guess what? It worked. They're going to pass one. Well, I've got a question. Which one of them up there is really worried about if they're going to get paid. They in the House, in a the lot of them. In the, in the Senate, they're all millionaires except Tim. In the House, <laughs> there are a lot of them worried about it. But again, then you have the Senate. You're back to the same old thing. We have a Senate that... Look, the House ain't life. perfect. I am not about to tell you the House is perfect. Right, we got our own challenges. All you've got to do is starve for Tim Scott. <laughs> Tim did very well in the private practice yeah. of insurance. <laughs> Congressman, it's time for you to go. I don't want to hold you and have your wife. I'd love to come back. I'd love to come back.